The sponsor of our show today is CNE Wildlife. CNE Wildlife partnered up with North American Deer Talk. We're incredibly grateful for that. If you get a, a chance or an opportunity, say thank you to them. And the reason is really simple. They have 30 years of commitment to all natural probiotics. This commitment's really a passion for them. And they've established that through university research at Texas Tech. Whether that be their fawn paste, their top score product, their show choice, farm pack, all the various products they have, they really provide a service and a set of products that helps your herd thrive. Give Sadie a call over there at CNE and uh, order up some good stuff. We think you'll like it. We know we do. We've been uh, product users for almost 15 years now. Um, we feel it's the best around. So get you some CNE wildlife today. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of North American Deer Talk. Today, it is May 3rd, 2022. I have Sean Schaefer, Executive Director of the North American Deer Farmers Association on the show today. Sean, how are you? Really good. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate you having me on. Sure. So as I, I do with uh, previous guests, I just always check and uh, see when I had you on last. Any guesses? Uh, it's been, I think it's been over a year, buddy. It, it has. So uh, March 24th, 2021, we had our last uh, Nadifa show. So right, right over a year. Yeah. We were due. Um, and I'll tell you, Josh, uh, you're probably my biggest critic for poor communication. Mm. You, know, admit it, you know, the whole world out there, uh, you know, that is with any prob- person with a problem, you need to admit your faults, <laughs> you know, admit you have a problem to fix them. Uh, I still haven't sent out, and we're going to be talking about it today, that's what's kind of led into this, but I still haven't sent out my little clips or snippets from our DC conference, our DC fly-in last week, and um, I never made any live videos over there, and that was a big thing you pushed me at, uh, I'm trying to think, two, three years ago there when you come out to 2019. DC. Here, four years ago already. 2019, yeah. COVID in or two years. Uh, I kind of like making them live videos. My struggle, though, is just like today, to be able to just sit down here and find that time. And people can say, oh, it only takes a few minutes, and it does. It only takes that few minutes. But, you know, I do like to edit out a thing here or there or whatever. And, and I try to try to do that like that downtime sitting in the airports. And you know what? It This day and age, I don't know what it is, but I don't have downtime in airports. Uh, I'm running from one flight and one plane to the next. And when you're up in air, you don't get nothing done. And uh, you know, turn off your phone, whatever. So I appreciate you giving me the time and reaching out here and, and, and doing this for hopefully the industry to, to sit and watch and enjoy. So and no, abs- abs- absolutely. I um and and for those that are uh, listening on the podcast, if you want to see um, uh, Sean and my uh, made for radio faces, you can check out our YouTube channel uh over at north american deer talk so just punch in north american deer talk into uh the youtube search bar make sure you subscribe over there and check it out um it, it is important and to your point um like i i, I try to do you know a short little video or uh, a sound bite here and there or some kind of social media post as we have many members uh at least in in our state of, of pennsylvania and nationally with nadifa that um, can, can just kind of catch up on some quick news, right? It's just like, Hey, here's what I'm doing. Like, here's what we're doing for you. Uh, and that's, you know, it's, it's important and it's a way to engage people. Um, I know I get, I get feedback all the time. I suspect you get it, uh, more, more than I do. Hey, Josh, what are you doing for the folks in Pennsylvania? Hey, Sean, what are you doing for us? You know, count X, Y, Z states. Right. And, and it's, it's just a, it's kind of that quick way to say, Hey, I, I am doing something. If I, if I spent all the time telling you the things I was doing, I wouldn't get any of those things kind of done. And it's, it's, I tell my, I tell my wife this, this story and then we'll, we'll, we'll get into the show. I, I promise. Um, you know, she'll, she'll, I'll walk in from a, from a day and she'll be like, what'd you do today? And I'm like, it was, just wasn't a good day. Well, what'd you do? And I, I'm like, I just don't want to go through it again. Right. And so you have some of those days, especially in the severe that we're working in, you know, however you want to look at it, um, our, our job and more specifically your job um, is, is a, is a political one. And that's the sandbox we must play in. 
and there's it's it's hard it's mentally taxing it's frustrating but like if we want to make progress on these things um we we have to play in that sandbox and you got to play a certain way so i can i can respect um you know the fact that if you haven't done a video in a while it's okay and uh, my my criticisms to you are are always in a a constructive nature and a, a friendly one so well, for sure. And, and, and I, I appreciate them. Like I said, I think they need to happen. I need to get more on them again here. We say this is kind of a slow time now coming in the spring is it actually speeds up on the farm, but the industry actually, you know, has a little bit, you know, with that said, I'm flying to West Virginia here in a week to work, do some stuff there with their uh, program. But, um, you know, it, it does seem like it, it is kind of getting into more of a, a little slower time for another month or so in the industry. So hopefully I can, get back in the habit of, of getting back out there in front of the people. Sure. Um, so I wanted to, I wanted to chat with you uh, mostly for selfish reasons as I do with um, most of the guests that I have on. It's just cause I like to stay engaged and I'm, I'm curious about the things that are going on. So um, I want to touch on the convention cause I know Nadifa had their, their annual convention. Um, this was our, our first time being, back in person, uh, in a couple of years. And, uh, you know, if you could just, uh, touch on the, you know, like when, when the convention was and kind of some of the highlights of the show and why, why you have that, um, and then we'll kind of, we'll, we'll transition into some other, um, a little more sensitive topics. Okay. Uh, as you said, you know, it was the first one in two years. So, you know, starting COVID stuff, uh, we had two, I don't know what you call them. They weren't, they weren't even really a hybrid. They were just purely virtual. The last two conferences, uh, it was in turn of just virtual fundraisers. Uh, last year, we did have a virtual new deer farmer seminar tied with it. Uh, so um, we did have a little bit of an education component to it there. So I'm helpful. I'm, I'm grateful that we got that done. But uh, this year, we're back to French Lick, Indiana. And we're going to be back to French Lick, Indiana again next year. Uh, part of the reason for that back-to-back -back is, you know, this, the big unknown of where we ever going to have a conference again, when were we going to ever have it, where, you know, so we try to plan at least three years in advance so we can give warning to people, tell them where we're going, you know, they can start their planning, get our dates set. Uh, part of it also to any of these larger venues like that, they book out three to five years in advance. So if you want to get a specific weekend, you need to be booked. Uh, hard to book when you don't know where you're going to be or if you're going to be able to have it in person. So uh, we, instead of reinventing the wheel, we just kept kind of kicking that can or just keeping that wheel, I guess. Uh, we stayed French Lick. That's where we were supposed to be. And the one that was canceled, we canceled that one and signed the next contract. And the next one, we just kept pushing it out. So we're going to do two back-to-back. -back. I'm looking for feedback from those that attend and those that don't attend. Um is there other places you suggest, other places you'd like to see us go? Uh, we're always open to, you know, to, to ideas. So if you have a solution or have an idea or uh, a suggestion, boy, reach out to me. I'd be the best bet. Is just tell me personally. If that don't work for you, uh, you know, one of the board of directors, you know, reach out to any of them or heck, call Marcy at the office. But uh, we're always looking for ideas. So um, do I think French Lick is the best place in the world? No, absolutely not. Uh, you know, I think it would be nice if it was closer to the airport. At the same time, for years, we avoided any place that wasn't close to an airport. But uh, several years back, I was after one of the conferences, and I was sitting waiting in the airport. I was kind of just doing a mental note, looking at the people that were there and who flew in, who didn't. And it's a small number or percentage of the actual conference attendees fly in. Now, the ones that do, you know, thank, you know, thank you for coming. But at the same time, we have, you know, 80% of the people that drive there. You know, it's in a big portion of them are pulling a trailer for the booths, you know, and, and now they're driving downtown Dallas, downtown Birmingham, pulling a trailer, dragging trailer, trying to find parking. You know, so I'm, well, I'm trying to make life easier for the guy that flies in and might have to get a rental car or get an Uber or this day, this day and age with the Uber, it's actually tough to even have to use that excuse because that's pretty simple but anyhow uh it, it was a bummer renting a car to sit there for four days and use it but the uber they can come get you take you back it's pretty easy there's a shuttle bus too whatever so i still would like to find a place closer to an airport 
but I still like the idea of being out in the country like we are, having big open parking, having no traffic, uh, centrally located. If you draw a circle around the industry, I don't know, name all the deer farming states that you know, or the top deer farm, the larger deer farming, whatever, the smallest deer farming states, draw a circle around them one time. You know that? French Lake and Indiana is pretty, pretty central for all of them. So, um, you know, that's a you know, thing too. We, we used to bounce it all around. We went to the extremes, you know, went to Florida, then we went to Pennsylvania, then we went to Texas. And, you know, we went all over. I can we were in Arizona years ago. But uh, so that's that's the challenge we have with booking. But we are booked for next year already, French Lake, Indiana, but looking for suggestions for 2024. Conference wise, you know, the industry, I, and I know with, with CWD issues, regulations, everything, things were, we're slowing down a tish, you know, and uh, as you went, if you go to these big sales, you know, uh, the number of booths at, at these sales were declining. The number of booths at Nadifa was declining. I remember when we had like 140 some booths one year, I think it was the best ever. Um, but we, we were declining and we were struggling. I think the last in-person event in Tulsa, I thought we had like 80 ish, you know? Um, so Attendance was starting to back off a little bit, you know, and um, all, but I can tell you this one here, we had just under a hundred booths and I think we would have hit a hundred, but I tell you life, life happens, you know, and we had deaths in the family. We had uh, medical issues. I mean, you name it. I just, I felt every time the phone would ring, I was like, oh my God, I just, what happened to someone again? I mean, it's, when you know these people personally, I mean, it hurts. You know, and, um, so there would have easily been, you know, a hundred booths booked and sold is what we had, but uh, it was just a little under that. So what a tremendous show uh, as far as that went. Attendance wise, was it a record? No, it wasn't a record numbers uh, by any means, but it was still great. It was better than the Tulsa show. So um, we are increasing. Well, I think we're back up. I, I'd say we maybe leveled off, you know, and so attendance was great. The, the booths were great. Um, we kind of backed off on the number of speakers. You know, when I first took this over, you know, we had a lot of concurrent sessions. We had a lot of different, we had people were running different directions. And you'd have two speakers at one time that you kind of wanted to listen to. You always had to get your spouse or your business partner, whoever, someone else sitting in the other one. And, and I was always trying to get away from that. Let's get more networking time, more trade show time, and yet still have quality speakers. I think we accomplished that this year. Uh, you know, two of the hot issues uh, we always hear about EHD, epizootic hemorrhagic disease. Uh, um, we had the latest on the vaccine for it uh, uh, from MedGene Labs working very well, uh, proven titers, you know, uh, going through a conditional licensing process with the Center for Veterinary Biologics. I mean, it's, it's the real deal. So uh, very good information there um, on the, CWD, the chronic wasting uh, side, you know, we hear a lot around this country about what we need to do to improve this industry, to fix, you know, things, to, to fight the regulations, the overregulation. The true, the true fix is fixing CWD, you know, chronic wasting disease. And, and I believe, and I look at like the, the scrapie industry and uh, the sheep industry is scrapie, it's the breeding that fixed that, you know, moving away from it. And and I've had some another day tell me, so we eradicated scrapie in this country? No, we still have scrapie. Does anyone really care? Not really. You know, you deal with it, you manage it, you find it, you work through it. That's where we need to get with the chronic wasting disease. Now, um, and maybe that's a lead with a segue into something that, you know, just kind of popped in my head as we're going. You know, there was a big move here a few weeks back on Facebook, all over Facebook, people were forwarding this, you know, this discussion from a guy in Texas on a biologist talking about CWD is just no more than scrapie. And I had a lot of calls on that. So Miss Josh, I hope you don't mind, I'm gonna drop this in here, but uh, I just want to quickly say, yeah, it's a TSC. It's a transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. Yes, they all are. BSC, Kurtzville, Jakob disease, you know, Kuru, uh, Feline, feline encephalopathy, mink encephalopathy. Correct, it is. But honestly, the chicken or the egg part of this doesn't really matter. Which one came first? It doesn't really matter. The, what matters, you know, even if it, 
no matter how the scrapey tie is, it's we still have to do something about it. Because if you're a sheep rancher and you have scrapey, they're going to still come in and, and do something about it. You just don't drag them off the rock pile and that's that. You know, you, you still have to do something about it. So, um, but the neat thing, back to the genetics, you can do something about it. And, you know, the, back to the Facebook post again and the social media stuff, you know, is it the breeding values or is it the genetic markers, the genomic markers? Which one is it? Which was the best one? Which works, which doesn't work? Um, it's a combination of both. And I'll tell you, I know both researchers, both camps, both, there is no two separate camps. There's one camp, it's a solution for CWD. And uh, we had uh, Dr. Justin Greenlee and, and Eric Kastman from uh, uh, Ames, Iowa, USDA's ARS, the Agricultural Research Services. And um, they gave some great presentations on the work they're doing there and the, and the research they're doing in Ames, Iowa, with the genomic markers, looking at the KKs, the HHs, the SSs. Um, you know, and I get beat up on this a lot too. People are like, well, we're, what's happening? Why aren't they telling us? They're not putting the information out. You got to remember, we're, I think we're in our second year into it. They just did, right before the conference, they collected the samples from, you know, that the second year mark. And, you know, it took a full year for the animals that they had challenged to become infected. And then we're waiting for those animals to infect the other animals because we're, in my mind, I hate intercranial. I hate injecting anything. I hate infecting anything because that's not natural. You know, we can give anything to anything that we want. We can give diseases to everything. So I want to see them animals get it. And even this truly is a natural. They're inside a research center, but it's as natural as we can get probably. Um, we're in that year mark from them getting exposed from the natural ones. So now we got to give that time. And ideally, they'll never get it, or they'll take eight years or 10 years to get it, whatever. But um, it's going to take a while. That's what the whole, I guess, you know, there's not a fast solution to this, you know, unless you want to get into the mouse models, which I don't like mouse models either. But but anyhow, they gave some really good information and, uh, and you know, an update on their um, research. Watch for it in the next coming up here and the upcoming Nadifa magazines. We'll have some articles on it. Tough for me to get in here and explain everything they said. Uh, get with the people that were there, you know, I guess it's a good reason to come to the conference. You'd hear it firsthand. And then uh, after they spoke, uh, Dr. Uh, Chris Seabury, Texas A&M, spoke about these genetic breeding values, answered a lot of the questions. You know, there's a lot of questions. There's animals that are past the cutoff value that still become positive. Yeah, I mean, it's going to happen. It's like these sheep that still get scrapey. Um, but hopefully it's going to be a lot less, you know, we, we know it's going to be a lot less than a whole herd getting it now. Um, it's a lot of it's dose dependency. We don't know those animals, you know, what, how big of whack did they get? You know, what was it? Uh, um, how long ago was it? How long have they been incubating? There's a lot of them unknown. So we're, we're learning on that. Uh, like I said, he gave a good update on that, good explanations, all that. I think the take home message to both of them is you need to start now. You know, it's kind of like planting a tree. You know, the best time to plant a tree was, you know, yesterday or 10 years ago or whatever it isn't tomorrow or next week, you know, uh, so we need to get started because doing nothing doesn't work. That doing nothing is not a solution, you know, and uh, we have monitored programs, but it's a monitor. You're hopefully going to find it and catch it when you have it early enough that we can do something about it, but it doesn't truly prevent you from getting it, you know. And so with that said, I'd like to, to give a quick plug as I've seen there's a messages too. I keep going to Facebook. I mean, that's the, maybe that's the information source we're all using, but yeah. The testing tubes that uh, the sample, tissue sample collection tubes, I think they're called TSUs, tissue sample units. Um, people are trying to order them from Valley Vet or order them straight from uh, Ytex or not Ytex, Allflex, excuse me, from Allflex. Hey, Ytex and Allflex, neither of them are sponsors, so we can switch them up all we want. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Ytex or Allflex, uh, you know, some of these guys are getting a message like they're eight to 12 weeks out. And that might be because I think they have commitments to their customers to provide them. But if you order them right from Neogen, if you go on the NADAR website, North American Deer Registry website and put a tissue or sample tube, get that little link sample uh, uh, button there. Anyway, it'll take you to a link. They'll take you right to Neogen or just punch up Neogen, N-E-O-G-E-N. 
and it'll take you to their site and go to those TSUs and you can order them. I got mine in three days. I ordered a hundred of them and three days later, they were at my doorstep, you know? So pretty slick, uh, cost $2.50 a piece. Nadar will reimburse you $3 when you use them. People don't understand. I, I know the other day, some say, well, I just do horn core. Or I just do um, hair samples. Been doing them hair samples for 20 some years, 30 years, it works, you know? Well, I don't think they understand. I think people think you open up that envelope, you shake all the hair out into the machine and it grinds it up and gets you the DNA. No. Some person sits down with this huge magnifying glass that they're looking through and they take the hairs out of that envelope carefully, hoping that everybody pulled them in their in kind of order and they lay them out on a slide and they got to line up all the roots and they got to put a piece of tape across it so it don't move, you know, and then they submit that and, and then they got to do it again with the next envelope and hope like heck there's not a piece of hair stuck to their finger, you know, or stuck on that bag that magnifying glass. It's a mess. Who's ever worked with hair? You know, those sample tubes punch that tissue right out, right into the alcohol. It's preserved and it's, it's, uh, it lasts. If you don't want to send them in right away and you're worried sometimes like a piece of hair gets stuck in that little ball and then the alcohol evaporates out, people get nervous about if it's any good or not. You can throw those little alcohol tubes into your freezer and they will last for years and years and years because now not only is it an alcohol, but it's stored in some freezer so just something to think about with that if you don't want to you know you want to wait to see what you know when you wean them what fawn survived which ones didn't just submit the ones that lived um you can wait and submit them in the fall but uh i really suggest everybody order those tubes now and they work that's neat to put out three punched hole in the ear to put the ear tag through later on i mean stuff like that. there's a lot of benefits to using it so uh and i know that ain't what the show is about josh but i just want to quick throw that in there no but and i tubes that make life easier and faster for your turnaround times and getting your samples back yeah and i i think um i think on that point it's important to know and i i recall i was fortunate to be at nadifa and listen to uh both the the greenlee and Cassman um and and seabury talks and and dr seabury talked about a call rate on samples and and what that was is it was basically inferring to the the quality of the the DNA that you were getting um, helps with the with the test and you know there's there's probably not a better form of DNA that we can provide on at scale cheaply than using these these TSU uh, sample units and and heck nadar has gone as far as to incentivize you by reimbursing you the cost of those um, it's it's really twofold and you touched on you touched on the one with the, the person sitting down and and you know placing those those hair and follicles on that slide um you ever you ever worked here in the winter and you're all static up and trying to get that hair i mean could you imagine sitting at a table placing all those those hair follicles anyway um yeah. so the um the those tubes they they're automated for uh, robots. Yeah, they got a barcode and I, what's that Her, little? Yeah, yeah. So they they yeah. th they have robotics that um, set all those up, and they can process those through. We have to remember that, and 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 I guess we can. Uh, we'll just do the whole thing. You know, Nadar talked about some of their lead times, and people. You know, hey, when am I going to get my samples? So on and so forth. Well, Parentage is coming back in three weeks. That's pretty consistent. Maybe they have depending on your quality of sample, maybe they have a, an issue and it takes four, right? And, and we know that the, um, the CWD test, the PRNP gene, and, and also the, um, the GPS testing, that takes longer. And it's because it's going to a different lab, that the lab that performs the testing is not NADAR's lab, right? NADAR's the facilitator. Um, that lab is doing 25,000 samples a day for other animal industries. They're the largest DNA lab in the world. They are the best DNA lab in the world by far. So, you know, we're, we as an industry are a very small piece of that uh, business model. We're fortunate that we're able to use that lab and that technology. Um, so you just, you know, be, be patient, but plan ahead, right? Use those TSU tubes. It'll make everything far more efficient. 
and, and I know this ain't a Nadar commercial here, but you know, uh, you know, Nadifa is one of the parent companies along with TDA and Vedavis to Mexico of Nadar. So I'll, I'll give a little defense here too. You know, people have said, well, what we switch labs, you know, there are not many, there aren't many other options for labs that can do that SNP technology. And the ones that are, you know, we have looked at, uh, Turner on times aren't any better. Uh, price is terrible. That's where we're getting here is the volume discount basically because of the, the amount of work they do. So, you know, the, the, the price is, is really terrible when you go somewhere else. So, you know, it's kind of a twofold thing as we're trying to get most accurate test we can and for the best price that we can. So I think as, as you've said, uh, you know, plan ahead a little bit. Don't wait till the week before the sale to be sending in your samples, you know, do we're all guilty, aren't we? Yeah, you're dang right. I am. I just got mine submitted. <laughs> um, and but with that also, I mean, well, I hate to say it again. I mean, I think we've mentioned COVID five times right here in this, mm. but you know, I mentioned my flight problems and that running from airport to everything, all the different canceled flights. It's still a, there's still a workforce shortage in this country. People just don't want to go back to work. Mm-hmm. Next gen, Neo gen there is, uh, having their issues too with the uh, um, turnover of staff, people yeah, staff. Not, not next gen, definitely I, Neogen. Yeah. Not next gen. Neogen, yeah, yeah, yeah. Neogen. Neogen. Thank you. Thank yep. you. Neogen. Hey, if you want to, yeah, Neogen. <laughs> so uh, they, they've having their issues too with their sure. with work staff. So I mean, hopefully we get through that as things, uh, and, and this is a whole nother new test thing. So it, it's going to get better. That's my commitment to you is it will get better. I promise. If you have any issues, Hey, don't be afraid to call me and I can, I can call and do some, uh, looking into it too. If you're having problems, I mean, let's, let's get down to it. So. Sure. Um, so hey, circling, uh, yeah, go ahead. Circling back to the conference. Circling back to the conference. So we had a heck of an antler competition. Mm. The, uh, one thing we did, and I don't know, I'm still having nightmares wondering if we should have done or not, but <laughs> we, we went back, we offered three separate years of antler competition because of the two canceled conferences. And we said, hey, it's not fair to those deer and fair to the farms that grew monster deer in 2019 or 2020 um, to have to compete against, you know, this year. So not that they're competing or they're different, but let's say, you know, Josh grew a monster two-year-old in 2020 and grew, grew another monster two-year-old in 2022. Well, instead of having a first and a second, now you could have a first and a first, you know, and let the deer compete against the deer of that year. So we had three separate contests. And I'll tell you, we are still kind of working through that. Uh, we're finding some issues. So, yeah, you might get called up. We might get, you know, and we're so this 22 conference was for last year's deer, the 21 deer. And, and then the year, you know, so it was, we probably needed to clarify that better. And also we were working from our Safari club, Safari club international They're They work separate from the DFA. They do the contest. And I, they had all new staff. You know, they've had a big turnover and we had our issues and challenges within them, you know? So, so not everybody recorded the deer into the right proper year. Let's say that. So uh, we're ha- we're still working through some of those bugs and get the right plaques out, people, and hopefully we'll have that all corrected when the magazine comes out. And um, so we'll we're still working on that. But either way, it was neat to see those tables, rows of all those antlers. I mean, they had a lot of antlers, three years worth there. That was that was fun. Uh, it's nice to see what this industry grows and it produces. Uh, you know, it's it's what it's about in my mind. It's so those antlers. You know, I just yeah. Hope- I- I really like the, uh, I like the antler competition generally. Um, it, it, you know, the fun part for me, I always try to submit like at least one set of antlers just to get them scored up. Right. And that's, you know, that's for me, like, I just want someone unbiased outside of myself or, you know, a buddy, uh, scoring those antlers. So I have that, Hey, this was officially scored at Nadifa kind of certificate. Right. And, um, you know, while you're back there dropping your antlers off, it's always cool to like walk around and see what's what. And then of course, you know, the culmination of that is the, the award ceremony, um, you know, in the morning on the last day and, you know, kind of standing there and seeing, you know, who, who did what, 
and, um, you know, getting those awards, you know, I've been fortunate to get a, a couple of awards over the years and it, you know, it makes you, it makes you feel good, right. Cause you're, you're, you're competing against everybody else that's there and, and it provides some, some recognition for your farm. I'd be remiss if I, if I, uh, didn't say that John Irvin has the most insane amount of awards that I've, I've ever seen. <laughs> and if you, if you haven't been to a deer show, uh, to see his booth. I, I always give him a hard time. It was a couple of years ago. I said, John, how many awards you got there? And he's like 72. And I was like, Oh my goodness. And of course he, he won like 20 more this, this past year. Um, so he's a lot of antlers, you know, but he does. Everybody he gets can a do lot that. Of bring testing. your antlers. If you got good antlers, bring them. You, know? you bet. So there are a lot of guys, well, I got bigger ones than that at home. Do you? Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like Bring them. Yeah. I, I, I just, man, I love, I love looking at antler. Of course, everybody else do does too. too. And um, yeah, it's important. Like bring your antlers, get them scored. They are what they are. Right. Like right. let other people see them. Um, exactly. nothing, you find some, ge- I, I found a couple gems on that table back there that you I, I did just... not know about. So right. anyway, come to the Nadifa for conference, put some antlers in the, in the uh, competition. I want to see them kind of doing this backwards we're ending with what we talked with the antler company <laughs> and but let's go to the beginning of this conference we started with a new deer farmer seminar mm. and uh i think right about 50 so 50 new deer farmers that's not bad um very good speakers a full day of just a lot of the basic information you know and uh just trying to help people get off on that right foot you know, so hopefully we put people in touch with the right, you know, industry leaders and, and vendors, you know, to, to help them out. So uh, something to think about next year. I mean, if you're new to this industry, you've been in this industry a year, two years, three years. If you've never been to that new deer farmer seminar, hey, welcome. Please come. You know, I mean, it's a lot of good information there, too. So. Yeah, I, I, you know, I've participated in that, not only from a, a listener's standpoint or a participant standpoint, but also as a, a presenter on a couple of different topics. And um, it's, I think it's an advanced class, right? Like, yeah, there's a lot of basics, but like, if, if you're, if you're paying attention there while you're listening, like there is a ton of really great info. Um, and, and if you go in there, you'll see guys in there that have 20, 25 years of experience listening away. Right. And there's a reason. Yeah. There's, so people, I've had some members upset. Why are we doing it on Wednesday? Why do it the year, the day before? You know, but, you know the conference is already so long. Now you got to come an extra day, and you know, and why does it cost fifty dollars <laughs> to come to that? You already paid your registration fee, and um, well, it's twofold. You know, number one, we don't want that new deer farmer to spend an entire day Thursday or Friday sitting in class and missing the conference, missing all the other speakers, and getting get, being able to interact and network with the other breeders around the country. So we do it ahead of time so they can do that. We also do it ahead of time to keep the old deer farmer out. If you want to come, come, but you're going to come a day early. You're going to pay 50 bucks. Uh, Because we did have issues years ago where some guy that, you know, trying to belittle someone else that asked a silly question or asked, I'm going to say a silly question, a new question, something that, you know, He'd never experienced it before, so it made sense to him to ask it, where the guy that's been doing it for 20 years, uh, well, that's just silly, you know? And so anyway, we eliminated that so that, you know, these people aren't, the new deer farmer's not afraid to speak up or afraid to ask questions, not intimidated, you know? And, um, and, and but ideally, you know, the, truthfully, on the 50 bucks, though, it isn't to keep the old deer farmer out, it's to help pay for your meals and the breakfast for that day is what it really is, because you are getting an extra day, but um, I would agree. Encourage- you yep. got to rent the room, the AV equipment. You got to get yeah. the people there. Like there's, yes. there's cost to anything and, and 50 bucks is pretty cheap. So yeah. I want to um, thank our sponsors. Uh, new dart has been one of the major sponsors of the uh, new deer farmer seminar. I think every year we've ever had it. So uh, thanks to new dart and Blair source for that. Um, uh, conference wise, a uh, fundraiser, very successful. I don't know that there truly was a deal to be had. Um, Everything brought good prices all the way through. And, you know, if I look back and I really pushed this last year, I attended every event I could. There, I think looking back on it, there were two, there was one event that I just absolutely could not get to. And then 
after the conference. Now we've had two. I haven't made it to Florida or Louisiana. Apologize, those two guys. But you know, I was there last year. I can't do them both every year. But um, but going into every event, all the fundraisers I was at, all the sales I was at. Well, I tell you, we had a heck of a year. This industry was thriving. I mean, it was rocking and rolling and. And Nadifa, I think, kind of finishes, you know, kind of ends the year. I, was, I don't think it starts the year. I think it ends the year. That Nadifa open sale was phenomenal. We had a, you know, we've had some soft Nadifa open sales in the past, and we debated about even having them. Uh, we made it a little bit smaller, changed up the venue, held it during the event um, Friday, and, geez, there was great sales in that Nadifa open all the way through. So what a great way to finish the year and, uh I, I'm looking forward to 2022 uh, leading into this next fawning season, the antler growth right now, I think to me now is the start of the next cycle. And uh, I'm glad that we were able to end last year's cycle. And I think we ended on a really strong, positive note. I really do. So. Yeah. I thought, I thought the, overall the convention was really good. Um, I had a, I had a really good time. I know the other people that um, I just chatted with throughout the the weekend or week weekend, um all enjoyed themselves and um you know hats off to Nadifa for you guys putting that on and it's a it's a it's a necessary thing right because you 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 have to you have to come figure out how to to fund Nadifa's operations right and the fundraiser is a big part of that the convention's a big part of that um at the same time it, it's a social event right so you you have this um, you have this really great component where you get to see old friends, you get to meet new friends, uh, and you get to raise some money for something that we all have common interest in. Um, and it's really important. And I, I, I know that, you know, again, we come back to the feedback, you know, I know again, that I've faced on a, a state level, Hey, what are you doing for us? And um, again, I know you have on a, on a national level and, you know, if you, I, I'm, I'm pretty fortunate because I, I have exposure to, to other industries, uh, livestock industries, uh, specifically cattle. And, and I look at their conventions and some of the shows that they do. And like, it's a, obviously they're different industries and they're different in size and scope, but they raise a bunch of money because their, their livelihoods depend on it. Or if their livelihoods don't depend on it, it's a passion or a hobby that they are really, really, really into, right? And yep. if you want to continue to be able to raise deer in the United States, and when I say deer, I mean elk and red deer and fallow and all that, you really need to take a hard look at um, where you spend your dollars and how you support um, various state and national agencies. Um, and and I, I know this sounds like a commercial for uh, for an ND for a PDFA, it, it kind of is, right? Because like I know the work that I do behind the scenes um, nearly every day, and I I get, continue to get exposure to the work you do uh, on a regular basis. And like it's like there's not a lot of people out there that are doing these things state and national level, and and we are we are guilty. Not like we as deer farmers are guilty because you know, like not all of us put our money where our mouths are and everybody has a different, you know, economic status that they have to play in. But I promise you that, you know, at a, at a minimum, your dues, whether they be 50 or 75 or hundred or 150 bucks, that's just the entrance to get in the door. That additional support goes a huge long way. And, and again, these, these conferences and fundraisers are really important. So if you can just try to participate in those in in any way, like, Hey, if you got 25 bucks and that's all you can afford to give, like, thank you. Right. Like, thank you very much. We appreciate it. And if you got 2,500 or 25,000 again, thank you. Like it's, it all goes to a, a really good place. Right. And, and Sean and I are going to, we're going to transition um, out of the conference after Sean's closing thoughts, which are going to be less than a minute because I don't want to harp on the conference too much longer. And I'm get off the conference, but I right into the. I wanted to say about the. Uh, I want to talk about mention the membership part of this. I think you hit the nail on the head. You know, I tell everybody, if you can only be a member of one thing, you should be a member of your state association because all the state associations, you know, do work with Nadifa. We work hand in hand, so. For sure, without a doubt, you need to be a member of your state association. So please, everybody, you know, 
make darn sure that you are a member. It's it's embarrassing, and it isn't just us. You mentioned the cattle guys. I know cattle guys, horse guys. It's it's 15, 20 percent of the industry, you know, that's supporting everybody else that's doing nothing. So, uh, you know, why is it that we don't have 100 percent of the deer breeders, you know? And I say deer loose to like you do too, because they're all in the deer family: elk, fallow, psyca, axis, whitetails, mule deer. Uh, why are you not a member of your state association if you're not? Hopefully, if you are, great. Um, and then the National Association, North American Deer Farmers, you know, I mean, you, you, you really, truly should be both, you know, and then, and, you know, at least for darn sure, if you can't make it to the conference, at least make sure you're paying your membership. Uh, that's the number one place to start for everything. So here we are, we got a whole year before next year's conferences. So um, get your dues paid, please. Just if, if everybody paid their dues, if everybody did a little, no one would have to do a lot. So yeah, I just wanted to end on the, that part is, yes, your membership is so important. It's, you just don't understand. You know? It is. And for all those that, that uh, are members, thank you. Thank you. Um, Rank the numbers. Yep. Okay. So we're going to shift gears from uh, convention to the political sandbox. Um, recently, last week, yeah, last week, um, you had a DC trip. Uh, I was I was also uh, invited to participate in that, and uh, we had some really good meetings. Do you want to just touch on um, the importance of the DC trip, and then uh, we'll get into some of the specifics? Yeah, I can definitely do that. Uh, you know, it's something that uh, you know we've been doing for many years now. My gosh, I'm thinking over 18 years. I've been going out there, 19 years, something like that. It's been a long time. Uh, longer than that already anyway um this was a hybrid you know i mentioned earlier about a hybrid conference this was truly a hybrid fly-in last year we did a fly-in the year before uh it was canceled and uh what we did then is you know because of the first year of COVID, myself along with uh our president uh and worked with uh capital consulting our lobbyist group out there and everything was basically phone calls and emails, you know, but we, we were able to maintain what we've had and, uh, and, and didn't lose anything through the event, you know, through that process. But then last year we went, we, geez, I think we had 30 some different, maybe even 40, some 45 different meetings all by zoom, you know, and with that, we were able to increase our, our appropriations, our budget just a little bit, you know, and, and grew it some more this year. Now, a lot of DC is still tough to travel, tough to get, you know, and, and it's not, it's COVID, a little COVID related, but, you know, some of it goes back to that January 6th thing where they stormed the Capitol, you know, and um, that has made it a pain to get in and out of. You you can't believe it. if you've never done it, you know, and it's, it's sad that you missed it in the, you know, because how accessible our public servants are, our congressmen, our Washington DC, our government, our US government, it was amazing. You get it, you know, and they'd say that, you know, a lot of other countries that come over here and then they as they work within, they can't believe how you can just you could walk up and down the halls of our capitals of our of our Congress, you know. And well, them days are over. You can't just walk, you know, and, and you can a little bit once you get in, but getting in's a lot harder. So to bring 30 people from you know 15 different states and to meet with 60 different offices. Whoa. I mean, it, it's just not happening right now in this day and age. So what we did is uh, the week previous, we scheduled a lot of meetings with uh, different state industry leaders. Part of it too, uh, historically, and we've just opened it up. If you want to go to Washington, DC, you want to represent your state, come on out, please. You know, and we will find you the meetings. We will set you up with your representatives, with your two senators, and uh, sometimes you don't ever get in with the actual congressman and the member themselves, but you'll meet with their staff, with their, their, the head. And, and honestly, it's this whole country's being ran by a bunch of 20, 22 year olds anyway. Um, but anyway, you know, we try to get in many actual member meetings you can, but most of them, you know, probably, you know, not most of them, probably a good share will be uh, with, with staff, at least people that are truly going to get our requests taken care of. But this year we focused on, you know, our lobbyists looked at who we are, who is the, you know, on the right key committees, you know, appropriations, agriculture, you know, natural resources. Those are the people that truly are 
are voting our industry and are controlling our industry. So we focused on them and we went out and targeted the states. Hey, we went to each of them states said, who do you have? We went to their state associations. We need your, your leaders within your state associations to um, get on a call, get on a Zoom meeting, you know, and we set up Zoom meetings for those people to discuss our issues. And from there then after that, a week of that, we set up meetings in person, face-to-face -face meetings with the actual chairman of the committees, you know, the, the senior staff or the senior congressmen on those committees. And that's where Josh came in here, you know, uh, Glenn Thompson from, you know, uh, Pennsylvania, you know, going to be moving up to the number one seat in, in agri uh, agriculture. Anyhow, um, and he introduced our, one of our bills that we introduced on the Senate, but on the House side, this Chronic Waste and Disease uh, Management and Research Act um, passed the House and back in December. So, so with that said, uh, Glenn Dice, Josh Newton, myself, uh, President Nadifa, um, Jacques Damas, flew out to Washington, D.C. last week, but with our con met up with our lobbyist and, and we did three days of just meetings all throughout the Hill there in both the Senate and the in the house side. And I guess they're probably rolling into some of our ask, I guess, uh, if you don't know the process, uh, within uh, to, to run our servid program on the USDA level, uh, TB, chronic wasting disease, you know, the program staff, uh, the different programs we have to make sure that our deer our, and elk, our servids are moving across state lines, you know, it takes money to run that program. And for years we had that program, you know, we, we, it, it, it was funded at a higher level. It came down 2011, almost got zeroed out. We barely kept enough money in there to, to keep the lights on. And that's when we got really active and kind of took over more on the lobby side and got a little more engaged in Adifa, you know, a lot harder back in. And, uh, and there were some tough political years there anyway, but we come into it. Uh, we've been steadily increasing that. And and getting money back for indemnity. And um, so in the 2021 fiscal year, we ramped it up from uh, 9 million up to 11 or to 14 million. Within that 14 million, it takes 4 million to run the program. And within that 4 million to run the program, they pull out the money we, we can use for indemnity and anywhere from 1 million to 2 million. And then their leftover money goes to these cooperative agreements, as you'll hear more and more about cooperative agreement funds. Uh, this past year, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin actually used some of that money to help pay for their breeders to submit those issue tubes, submit breeding values, and, and, and to actually do get the genetic makeup of your herds and try to incentivize people to breed away from chronic wasting disease. Um, with that, and as everybody's aware, I mean, CWD is popping up. We popped up in three more states this year, you know, and uh, that, you know, not industry related is in the wildlife, but uh, is, as we're getting more and more of it in the wildlife, we're seeing more and more of our farmers being hit with chronic wasting disease, uh, spillover in the environment, whatever it is that, you know, coming in the hay, the scavengers, the, the voles, the, you know, whatever, the dirt, the dust, the mud on our tires, dump mud on our shoes, however it is, it's getting into our pens. And we're, we're having, we're seeing more CWD. We've had more depopulations, which I'm opposed to depopulations. I'm opposed to indemnity. I'm opposed, I want to keep people farming, but that doesn't always work, you know? And, and it's easy for us to say, you know, they shouldn't depopulate that guy or that guy shouldn't take it. But, you know, feeding animals with no markets, a tough thing too. put your guys in that, put yourself in that guy's shoes. I mean, it isn't always easy. So there are times that indemnity is needed and that's why we make these trips. Um, our big push, we had basically two for this year, but the one was increasing that 14 million up to 21 million. And we're gonna add 4 million, you know, move our, our indemnity up from that one to 2 million up to a solid 4 million. And then right now it's as money's left over and you know, they can use money as needed, whatever for indemnity. Uh, actually changing that language a little bit to saying must be used for indemnity. So the 4 million would be strictly 100% would have sideboards on it for indemnity. And if 
at the end of the year or, you know, the dollars weren't all spent, well, then they can use it for whatever program. But, you know, let's switch it around to where, you know, we're not, you know, at the tail end, we're going to be at the leading end. Um, so get, increasing the indemnity dollars if needed, you know, and, uh, and you know, so we, that money would be there. We're not waiting. We got herds right now that seem like we're always catching up. You know, there's a couple million dollars worth out there always waiting. And, and the longer they wait, the longer they incubate, the longer, the worse the problem gets. With that said, then also increasing the cooperative agreement money, because we need to get these herds, these, these states, I mean, apologize, I'm asking your industry leaders and your members out here, work with your state governments, your state department of agriculture to apply for these cooperative agreement funds, to get management dollars in there so that you know, maybe the, the first thing isn't to go in and indemnify a herd. We should be going in there and doing the live testing, doing the genetic makeup, find out what we are working with as the sheep industry. Back to the scrapey thing we talked about earlier. Let's go in here and, and figure out how to keep these herds farming, how to keep them out there in rural America and supporting the rural America, uh, you know, these rural schools and hospitals. And so that's our big goal is to move away from the indemnity, but we need funds to do that. And that's where we're increasing that cooperative agreement part of it as well, too. So there'll be funds within our state agencies to manage this disease and to manage these farms and, and not let people just sit out there and feed animals for years waiting on indemnity or waiting on a solution. Um, and, and then with that, I think that takes me to, you know, let's jump in any time, Josh, if I'm missing something, but the Chronic Wasting Disease Research and Management Act that we talked about earlier that passed the House uh, Senator Hoven from North Dakota, my senator, introduced it on our last day that we were there. It actually was introduced on the Senate side now. And it's authorizing up to 70 million. So once we get this, we still got to go chase the dollars to get uh, um, to get that funded, which it will be funded, just about what level. Um, and I got no doubt that's probably going to be up at that 70 million. You know, so let me let me jump let me jump in because I I want to I want to walk through this um, kind of pragmatically so people can have an understanding of of what is going on. So there's there's a uh, you mentioned it chronic wasting disease management and research act um, that you had mentioned that it was introduced uh, over in the house side by uh, Thompson and Kind. Um, yep. So Representative Thompson is out of uh, Pennsylvania and Representative Kind is out of Wisconsin. Um, and and that's a it's a bipartisan bill when they when they do this, we try to have bipartisan support for getting these bills introduced. Um, that way there's there's buy in politically on both sides of the aisle. Um, so Representative uh, Thompson's a, an R and, and Kind's a D. So with that said, that um, passed the House uh, with with pretty much overwhelming support. It, it had yes. really, really strong support for it. Um, right. That, that bill we've been, we've been waiting uh, for, for some time now for that to be introduced into the Senate so it can get circulated around and, and start building support for that. And, and you had touched on that you're a Senator and, and the work you've done with Senator Hoven uh, to get that introduced. We've been kind of waiting uh, anxiously. When's this going to happen? When's this going to happen? And, and on our trip last week, uh, Thursday specifically in the afternoon, um, we got that done. So that's in the public sphere now. Uh, we have, again, a, a, a bill that's been uh, passed through the House side. It's now over in the Senate. Um, our, our job is to, to build support for that. And um, this is a big, like, this is a first of its kind bill. This is this is and and to be clear, there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of uh, a fanfare uh, about how this came about. This is this is the work of Nadifa. Nadifa started this process in 2019, and it was a it was a smaller bill with a smaller ask, and they built a coalition with the wildlife agencies. That's going to include Rocky Mountain Elk and Boone and Crockett, and you name the list of, of wildlife agencies. And that coalition was, was, was built in part from Sean's work uh, on this. And, and it is now a, a bill that has a lot of substance, a ton of support on both sides of the fence, 
And, and these funds are going to change how chronic waste and disease is researched and managed in North America. That, that's a fact. And, and I'm confident that in time, this bill is going to get put through. It's going to get appropriated. We're going to get funds from that. Now, I want to jump back to the, the uh, first part of our survey program. And you, you talked about the cooperative agreements. What is a cooperative agreement? Federal dollars supplied to the state agencies to use for that that particular disease. Um, you know, the, your state agencies have been working with USDA, the federal government, for many many years. And you know, from Yoni's disease and cattle or whatever, there's there's many different programs. But that's how that state then gets assistance from the federal government to work through that problem. And um, they're, they got it's a it's a competitive thing. You can't just apply and automatically get money. They got to say, hey, this is what I'm going to use it for, you know. But you got in depth, you got to be able to justify what you're how what they're doing with it. And but I mean, if if everybody's doing the right thing, you're not just you know using it for vacations, whatever. I mean, you will get approved, you know. So that is money that uh, you know the private sector can Josh Newton apply? No. Can Pennsylvania Deer Farm Association apply? No. But you can work with your state Department of Agriculture and do, you know, as, as Pennsylvania's with this uh, issue tube thing, you know, you can you can apply, you can work with them. So let me, yeah, let me let me touch on that because I think it's important. Um, and and you had mentioned that um, uh, Michigan and Wisconsin also um, right. were participants. They they applied for these dollars. Um, through this this cooperative agreement money, and and it's you know it's a it's a few million bucks, so it's not it's not insignificant. So I'll speak to Pennsylvania and, and what we did because I know that there's going to be folks listening from other states that have interest in um, in these funding initiatives. And I can say all three states are slightly different. They Everybody they are the program is slightly different. So so for those that are interested in these dollars and and the importance of them. Um, basically our department of agriculture, uh, submitted a, a proposal, um, for a program in our state to the USDA. They reviewed that. Of course, there was letters of support that myself and Sean, and I know Dr. Seabury, uh, had submitted for those. And basically that program is to help, um, kick off this, um, genomic susceptibility testing in our animals and start to get herds in Pennsylvania, uh, certified, if you will, with their their testing. So those dollars are available. This jumping back to the Chronic Waste and Disease Research uh, and Management Act, there's going to be more of these dollars coming. There's going to be more opportunity for various states across the country to come up with unique and novel ways of researching and managing chronic waste and disease. So get creative, have brainstorm sessions, talk with your department of ags and make sure that they know that these funds are available and that they're applying for them because there's more coming, right? right. And we need to take advantage of this as an industry. And, and again, this is gonna be, you, you touched on one, a farm gets quarantined. Instead of killing those animals, we can go through and live test. We can go through and genomically sample them. We can keep them in business. We can remove the high-risk animals. This starts to shift the narrative um, nationally that our herds are source herds of infection and that CWD is only in deer farms and all this hogwash that everyone who's listening or has you know a little bit of common sense understands is, is not the case and knows that we are a very valuable resource for fixing this problem, you're going to see this shift, right? You're going to see all these herds becoming less and less susceptible. Our number of positives will continue to go down and, and everything starts to change then. So I can't stress the importance of this, this funding um, and, and, and why we need to take advantage of it. But I just wanted to touch on that because um, I think those cooperative agreements, uh, they're not new to, to anyone in the political sphere. They're very new to our industry and our ability to be able to um, use them and take advantage of them through uh, various stakeholders. So I just wanted to, to, to point that out. Let's jump you know, on. Uh, yep, go ahead. Back on that. And that kind of reminds me, brings up another thought here on this, this 
Management and Research Act, you know, Research and Management Act, or I think is what I call it. But uh, the research, my, to me, is the main component, the first component. Um, so the money we've gotten, you know, and it's these trips to DC, uh, and I go back and I think all you have wrote about this, you know, in, in many different articles, whatever. But not many people read those those articles. But we've gotten money for for the USDA ARS, Agricultural Research Services, for Justin Greenlee, their Ames, Iowa. We've gotten money, uh, and I think that's up to like six and a half million dollars now. We've gotten, uh, you know, I think we're up to four million now for the Fort Collins, Colorado out there, the uh, USDA's Wildlife Services at the National Animal Disease, or National Animal Disease Center, Ames, Iowa. National Wildlife Center is at, uh, in, in Fort Collins. You know, and that's, that's the, the grandfather, the founding spot of CWD back in the 67, 1967. So, but they haven't been doing research in many years because the funding dried up. So now, you know, let's get research going back in those naturally infected pens. So we can have natural research instead of this injected, intracranial injected stuff. But we've driven a lot of research their way. Uh, USGS, uh, we've, you know, gotten to help support some of their research. You know, all that's government research. You know, I'm nothing against our government, but at the same time, I think there's sometimes there's reasons people work for the government because they can't make it in the private sector. <laughs> so anyhow, um, this Research and Management Act is not going to the government. You know, it's going to the private sector. It's going, it's going to our land grant universities. So I think this is going to bring researchers out of the woodwork. People that were doing this years ago that all of a sudden now can come back free on experts that, you know, had to move on to something different because there's no funding. Uh, we're going to see a lot more eyeballs, a lot more people staring at this, a lot more minds working on it. And I think that's going to be the huge thing. When And if you look at just where we've gained in the last several years with technology and with the testing and and look at just the technology itself. You know, we all got computers on our hips, you know, with our cell phones and technology is just, is, is just crazy how things have increased and gotten better. You know, the SNP technology we're using, you know, heck, it's a decade old already. It's been cattle industry been using it forever, but boy, has it been refined. And, you know, the bug's been worked out of that system. It ain't something new that we got to figure out. They've been using it. We just need to start applying it. And I think with... Uh, with these, with the funding there now, and the universities coming on board, and the technology, the live testing, the RT Quick, these amplification tests, whatever, um, things should change fast. That's where I see a really bright future, bright horizon for us, because I, you know, it's going to happen, and uh, we just need to get started. We need to follow through with it. We need to support, like you said, the state association, support your national association, so we can make sure this stuff is happening, and we make sure it's continued to be funded. Um, you know, we can argue and fight about should we be doing this or that with chronic waste and disease? Are we over-regulated? Re yes, we are. Um, but the true solution to the problem is taking care of the disease. You know, fix the disease. Let's do that and get rid of, you know, to where it's not a problem for us. It's not a burden for us. You know, if can we do that on the wildlife side, it's not going to be as easy. But you know what? Take care of ours. If it's not a problem for us, I'm not worried about theirs. I'm betting their problem goes away. You know, if ours goes away, they're not going to want to talk about their problem anymore. But uh, hey, if we can help them with theirs too, great, because then it won't be spilling over in our pens. But regardless, it's an issue that needs to be taken care of. I think it's going to happen. I'm really excited about what's coming down the pipe here in the future, you know, and um, we're there. I mean, it's, it's happening now. And I feel way better now than I did six years ago. You know, I mean, it's, we're going to see it, see great things coming. Yeah. I, I, I think that's, um, I think that's a, a great segue into, um, you know, some, some final thoughts about, you know, the importance of following through on these different agreements following some of the the bills and stuff going through um you know kind of a a closing note on on the defa and 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 the work obviously we covered a whole bunch of stuff that uh nadifa uh, has done over the past year and and currently is doing um any final thoughts that you have before we we wrap up you know one quick one and maybe this is uh 
didn't even say it, but you know, I sit and I look back, you talk about the work we've been doing and I still get the work you've been doing. I was there when you testified in front of your Pennsylvania Senate, you know, and uh, you know, it's, I know you're doing the work, you know, and I, heck, I know I'm doing the work. I, we talked about earlier, I'm very poor at communicating it, letting everybody else know it. Uh, one thing I refuse to do is, is to get in a dang war of words or in a debate with people on Facebook. I talked about it several times. I see the things that people are saying on Facebook. I read it. We're following through, trying to keep our pulse on the fingers on the pulse of the industry. But, you know, please out there in internet land here, don't expect to see me get on there and get in a tit for tat with somebody on Facebook because that's just, that's a, a losing battle, a waste of time. I don't have the time to communicate, let you know what I'm doing, let alone get time to get on there and argue with someone that's never left their basement, you know? So uh, these, these internet warriors. Uh, so I'm going to ask you, I mean, if, if you see that happening and you hear these people, these so-called experts or people that are complaining on the internet and all they're doing is complaining. They're not doing anything positive or constructive. Hey, uh, you know, maybe correct them or ask them what the, what they've done lately to, to help better this industry. You know, how many miles have they put on? You know, how many hours and days away from their family have they done? You know, I've seen Josh, you know, like you said, uh, get out there in the trenches and, 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 you know, he's not at home with his kids and his family, you know, his wife doing when he's out there working. So uh, that's all I'm going to, you know, like to end on that is, you know, rest and trust that we are doing. If you don't know that, give me a call. Everybody's got my phone number, 651-212-1315. It's public. It's there. Easy to find. You know, call and ask me, you know, or if you have troubles or problems, call and tell me, you know, ask what, you know, let me know what I can do to help you. That's what I'm here for. Um, Josh as well, your state leaders, not just Josh, but all the different state associations, reach out to your leaders and work with them. But biggest thing is support them and you know, if you got an issue or you don't think they're doing what you should be doing, hey, bring it to me and let's find out. Let's see what we can do to make that difference. You know, if you want to be part of the pro part of the solution, you want to help out too. And instead of sitting at home in armchair worrying, you know, being an armchair warrior, you know, hey, give me a call. We'd glad we'd love to have your help. Um, because you know, the negativity and and this, you know, trying to put a, a spin on everything, that isn't fixing anything. It's not. I mean, the true fix in this is, I think it's going to be the science. So Josh, well, I, on. I appreciate those, those closing thoughts, Sean, and, and certainly the, the work that Nadifa does. And, and it's not obviously just you, there's, there's uh, some office staff and, and the board, um, you know, going through and deliberating and, and having meetings and, you know, setting up all the events and just everybody kind of chipping in and, you know, the overwhelming majority of folks are, are volunteers. Um, so it's important just to uh, say thank you to them. So with that, it, it takes yeah, a village. Yeah, it does. And, and, and with that, we're going to wrap up. Sean, thank you for coming on the show. And as always, stay tuned for another episode of North American Deer Talk.